This is Leadership in Action, and I'm Casey Cheshire. Join me as we delve deep into the passions, expertise, and experiences of Boston area innovators. Sponsored by the Boston chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization, this is Leadership in Action. And we're recording. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm excited about this one because I, longtime friend, colleague, amazing business leader, business leader with soul is the guest today. He is a technical savant. He has monk-like focus. He is an absolute athlete. I think he could probably run circles around anyone else in the EO Boston chapter. He is a good friend and an all-around badass, co-founder and chief revenue officer at Galaxy Web Links. Varun Bahani, welcome, sir, to the show. Thank you for having me. And I don't remember if anybody has given me such a nice intro, Casey. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome, man. I'm glad you're here. I mean, we go way back. EO, same forum. We do some hiking, some adventure. Oh, I should have called you an adventurer, see? If I, if I had a chance to go back, I'd add more to your, yeah. your introduction. Absolutely. Oh, you are the one who got me into everything EO and hiking and all the adventure stuff that I do. So you are the one who I would give all the credits to. Yeah, I'll get out of oh. here. You're the guest on the show. I'm just a host. I just... <laughs> I just hit record and, and then I shut up. So with that, I want to start yeah. the show off right and and pass you the baton and ask you the question that we start off all of the shows with. What is a common misconception around leadership or being an entrepreneur? So this is something that I have always believed in, but this thought has resurfaced recently when I was reading through some of the articles and um, the author wrote it very well, and I'll try to use uh, the way he mentioned it. Um, the common misconception I think people usually believe it and believe in is do the quality work and the customer, the client will be happy. I don't believe that's, that is necessarily true. I think it's the other way around. I think, so quality is important, but to me, um, it's all about customer experience. I think it's all about how you interact with the customer during, right from the process, right from the point when you get them onboarded and hire them as a client uh, or get them as a client. So like it, it's, so what does that mean? What does the client experience mean? What does the quality work means? So when I talk, when I think about client experience, I, I feel it is more about if the customer has been taken care of, how have you communicated? How have you set up the expectations with them right from get go? How have you set the cadence of the meetings of the way you have uh, aligned the work that you are promising that you would do? How have you um, made sure that the, the the deliverables, the things that you said you would do are being done and communicated to them on every step on every milestone that you do. And I'm talking about more from perspective of, you know, um, it, it focused more on service industry. So we are in software development. So we do digital product development all the time, and this is what we do. And it can be applied to any service industry. So that's what I believe in, that customer experience is the most important aspect of keeping the customer, of keeping them happy, help that would help you grow. That will help you get more referrals. That will help you get retention because at the end of the day, you are making sure that they like you and the way you work. That doesn't mean that you don't do the quality work, right? Of course, you know, don't get me wrong. Quality is important, but I would give this higher uh, priority over quantity. Yeah, you know, it's a really, it's like, counterintuitive it's almost like a paradox because i think we we're all taught early on and all the work in kaizen and six sigma the idea of quality being so important but i think we can overemphasize it and you're right man i think back to experience i had uh one of the people in my last company she was like our she was our most technical person she was brilliant she knew more about pardot than i did and not saying a lot. Uh, it, it, she's brilliant, absolutely wizard with the technical side of it. And I once had a conversation with one of the clients that she was working on, and they said, "You know, we're having a 
you know, she's brilliant. We're having a good time with her, but we're a little uncomfortable because we're not really sure if she likes us or not. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, right. like the client wasn't sure if the person on our team liked them and, yeah. and they, they weren't anything, they weren't like good or bad. They were just a, a normal client, but the, we had the conversation with the staff member that look, it wasn't enough just to build the, the widget or send the email or do the task that you talked about. There is something else there. And it sounds like this client experience you're describing is exactly that. It's that client experience that trumps even the, the technical execution side. Yeah, even that. So that's exactly right. You know, it, there, there must be moments when uh, the process or the way she communicated with the client it was rocky, right? It right. it did not go well. They may not. They may have missed some meetings because this happens all the time. There have been, there there could be frustrating moments in on the both sides, which would want you to walk away, even though the quality of work is fine. They're happy with the final product, but during the process, if you have nickel and dime with a client, for example, right, that would give that would leave the bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. You know, at the end they would be happy, sure. Yeah. They, you delivered the work, but would they come back to you again? Maybe not because the experience you gave them was not. I mean, I really like the um, analogy of um, going to a restaurant, for example. You can go to any restaurant and, you know, it doesn't matter what quality food comes out of the kitchen. It's about the whole experience that you get right from the time you enter the restaurant, right? The ambience, the way the waiter take you to the table, you know, and how they are set up, how the arrangement of the place is, how far are you sitting from the other guests, what utensils, what type of plates, qualities uh, of the silverware are they using, how their bathrooms are. You know, there are so many t little things that can make a difference that you may not think about the food quality that much as you would like the whole experience, the way you spent that time in that place so yeah. You know. yeah and if you think of the overall experience being the the ultimate flavor in their mouth then you're right all those other things can can add they're like spices that can add good or bad to that experience and i think about a restaurant that we went to one time where it used to be moderately upscale nothing too fancy but like a nice place to go with a family yeah. and i remember when they switched from cloth tablecloths to paper you know, and, and, and not to say you can't have a good restaurant with paper, but we, yeah. we noticed, right. We noticed yeah. it was like, oh, and it's kind of cool. Cause the kids can draw on them, but at the same time, yeah. it just had a different feel to it. Yeah. Um, you know, smells is another thing. Does it smell like all the things you want to eat yeah. or walking in that walkway? Does it smell like chlorine from the walkway? Yeah. It's just all it's these little things. Yeah. Th little things. Yeah. So. So how, think, how do you, how do you wrap your head around that? Cause there's so many little things. How do you make sure that the client experience is good in the end? Well, it, it goes back to setting up the right expectations, expectations, uh, especially in the service industry, right? When I, I can talk about a uh, way we do, you know, when we engage a client right from day one or, or, you know, when we sign them up, there is a kickoff call. Like we start the project when we say like, this is what is going to happen. This is a roadmap. This is a time that we will show you this every week. We are going to set up a meeting cadence. So, and if, and we make sure that happens, there are project delays, but if it is very important for us that we communicate that even if, it, if there are delays, even if we have done mistakes, there are companies who would just hide that. They would not just bring it up because of the fear, like, you know, people, client may not like it, but you know, we make sure that we are upfront, we are transparent, we communicate, you know, that goes a long way uh, in setting up the right expectations. And that is even more important these days when everyone is remote, right? Oh, um, yeah. So COVID has not, you know, help that at all. Like it has even required us to be more proactive and more clear and transparent. We are in the industry of, you know, in offshore outsource business for us, it is even more important, but it can be applied to any industry, you know? Um, so that, that, that's yeah. what we do. Yeah. Expectations is such, it's such a, um, setting the right expectations. I, I remember 
some of my team, just telling them that, look, it, it doesn't really matter if you did or didn't deliver. Yeah. If they're in, in actually with a really good team, if a customer is ever not happy, it's almost never the delivery because you got yeah. it figured out. You're good at yeah. it. You can deliver it all day. Restaurant, you're good at the delivery. They just expected something different. Yeah. Um, and getting really clear about being up front. And I love that you mentioned the idea that, that you'll say what will happen in a roadmap, but then that you'll make sure it actually happens. It's like, yes, do what you say, say what you do. Um, and that's how you build trust, right? I mean, in relationships as well as in companies and, yeah. and business. That's what you're doing. You're building the trust, right? That is yeah. exactly what is happening. And when the trust is established, they would want to work with you over and over again. They will find you more reliable than any right. other vendor, even though, you know, you, your quality is, you know, a little less better than, uh, or it's not that as good as the other vendor, but, um, in today's world in technology, like I think everyone, I think most of the companies, um, most of the competitors that you deal with, they will, at the end of the day, will bring the similar quality work. This is one thing that will differentiate you from others. And that is what, you know, as a service industry uh, or, you know, entrepreneur in the service industry, you would want to find that key factor that can help you get ahead. You know, it's a good point that your competitor is probably going to have a similar quality and you can't yeah. really compete. Oh, oh, ours is more shiny or yeah. ours will do that much better. It's, it's a really hard yeah. thing to justify. You don't really know the answer to that. So it's really hard to say that you're going to be that much better. Yeah. I mean, no one really shops car oil that way. Like, oh, it's, you'll be eight, eight X faster. Or your car will last longer. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to, to compare on, yeah. on just the quality like that. Exactly. Some, sometimes they don't even want ATEX. We, they may not want the, you know, long lasting uh, oil. They just want to make sure it is reliable. It right. is trustworthy. You know, it doesn't right. break down. And that's what you want to strive for. Yeah, man. And, and clear communication, not only setting it at the beginning, but then continuing to have it. You mentioned earlier the idea of, you know, meeting a cadence of meetings so that not only do you set expectations, but you continue to set them and reset them and continue yeah. to state them uh, so that people, it, we all forget what they were, what they were supposed to be. Oh, we we're supposed to do on Monday or when was, yeah. but if you kept stating it over and over again, you're less yeah. likely to have to tell them that they forgot yeah. what the expectations were and you can just yeah. keep them informed of them along the way. That makes a lot exactly. of sense. Yep, absolutely. Man, that, what, what a cool, what, what got you fascinated about this topic? Have, have you been experiencing that lately or like what kind of drew your attention to this? So I think it, this goes back to my previous thing. Like, so, so this is something I have been trying to communicate. I, mean, I don't think we as an organization have been tremendously successful in achieving this, but this is something I've always believed and I've been trying to help um, get our team used to this concept and adhere to that and adopt it. And I think we have come a very long way. And the, the reason why I think it's basically in our industry, you know, we are not doing things that nobody else is doing. Like we are right. still doing very similar things than, you know, 1000 other companies. So what, where will we add our value? This is one aspect of that. Like this is where I think we have been very successful in distinguishing ourselves from our, you know, peers. Like, you know, we are reliable. We are trustworthy. We can, you know, do things. Well, we, we will do what we'll say we will do. Yeah. You know, that's why I think I'm, I'm more fascinated. I'm more interested in making sure we establish that thing more than anything else. Um, because at the end of the day, everyone will provide the same quality, same price. You know, it, it's not, nothing going to change, but this is something that can differentiate us. You know, and I, I hear you say we are trustworthy and I can see that conversation working internally. But then when I think about marketing for, you know, from my background, I think you can't, you can't tell people that they have to experience it. Right. You can't, Hey, we're, we're trustworthy. I think well, I was shopping something the other day yeah. and this company, oh, it was, um, 
I was trying to roll over like an old 401k into uh into an IRA and the company, I think I even have the website. It literally said we were ranked sit here. I even have it. it. Said we were ranked the number one company. Is it these guys? Maybe. Uh they said we're we're the most um trustworthy financial company on the planet or something. We're we're yeah. the the most ranked that and it was like, what? That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, why are you saying that? Why do you have to? Why do you have to say that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you 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 don't want to. Well, of course you're right. You you from marketing standpoint, you cannot win the customer by saying that. You have yeah. to have them make you know have them experience that. And I think that can only come with over time when you have worked with many many you know companies and when they start talking about you when this that's where you know you know. Uh, Referral business, and that's why the yeah. relationship. That's why the you know constant engagement with a similar customer plays a very important role. Um, and you use those stories and use their names and referrals to win more customers. I think that's where it comes in play because your customers become your advocate, and they are talking about your trustworthiness versus you talking about yourself. Yeah, and that's the reward for doing this yeah. right: is that yeah. you get the best lead source on the planet which is referrals from customers and friends. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. I love to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, some other questions just related to, you know, being in leadership and being in position. Um, you know, there's a cliche, there's a sort of phrase that it's lonely at the top, or yeah. I like to say like it's can be somewhat disconnected or isolated when you're leading a team or a company. Uh, are there any communities you look to or resources that you found help you keep connected as you're as you're growing your company, well, you know what? Um, before joining EO, right? I, I, I always felt the gap. I always felt that there is something missing in the way I have been operating and living my life, because I always like all my friends, all my you know family members, most of them, I don't, I'm not surrounded by people who run businesses. So I have no idea, right. you know, how other business owners think. The challenges I face, I, you know, I, I, I have nobody to share with. Um, I think th this is what makes that saying, you know, lonely at the top. That's what you keep hearing from people, entrepreneurs and other, you know, people and members in you. Know, so. And so to answer your question, no, I, I have never, I, I, I don't think I've looked um, anywhere else um, after, um, even before joining you, I think I, I've been, uh, I've never looked, but I've always felt that need. And after joining you, I think that that need has been uh, fulfilled. I think that, you know, joining the community and joining the forum, it has changed the way and brought that uh, and filled that gap that I've always found missing, right? right. So, um, so yeah, this this is a game changer for me in my business and my personal life because this is like you you need somewhere you you need a place where you can get things off your chest and you can trust people, you know, who are not making any judgments. And I I there are stuff that I can't even share with my with my better half, with my kids, with my parents, with my wife, you know, with my even partners. Um, yeah. so those, this is a place where, you know, you, you want to be. Do you have any, any like favorite experiences from any EO events or? I think, well, for me, <laughs> of course, um, you know, uh, one, 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 so one game changer, I think in my life was definitely you know, finding that. F so I, before joining you, I think I, I always talk about me getting into hiking with you, right? We started right, doing, right. I think I would have never imagined getting myself out in the weekday when everybody else is working. And I have that freedom to work, to go out with other business owner and spend that time, you know, I think. I, I, I will never forget that. I think that experience has definitely given me, opened up my mind to yeah. do things, I've, you know, that I want to do with 
other with someone else because otherwise I was all alone, you know? Yeah. So that experience would be the one that would I call you know, I would make sure that I I, I would remember, you know, pretty much all my life. Same. Um but and we got more balance to climb too. We do, we do. Unfortunately, I mean, you're talking about, you know, <laughs> uh, moments like, you know, when I joined EO, it was in the middle of pandemic. So I've not been able to, that is something I'm looking forward to, to get people back in person events and, you yeah. know, have more of those experiences and can, I probably be able to share more with uh, incidents with you that I, uh, I experienced, but, you know, I'm, I just, I think I just did one, um, in DC. Um, other than that, I don't think I've been to many personal events in person. Yeah. I'm excited to get back to those as well. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about, um, if there's a question, cause a lot of this is, you know, whether it's EO or other groups, the idea of being able to interface with other CEOs, is there any, like, if you were to ask a hypothetical question, if you were to ask a question of a hundred CEOs, like, yeah, is there anything you'd be curious to ask them? Yeah, I think. One question that I um, I would like to ask, and once you become really successful, there are challenges that come with success, right? Yeah. I would like to ask them, how do you deal with the challenges that come with success? I think that's something that I always think about, like, you know, success doesn't come at free of cost, I mean, you have to, you know, sacrifice things to, to succeed and uh, let go of things and compromise and, you know, face challenges. And when you face them, how do you deal with them? You know, what do you do? How do you prepare your mind? How do you, what do you do? Yeah. You know, how do you face, deal with those problems that come with it? Yeah. Like the mindset to be able to, yeah. Address them. It, and I've, I've had some great coaches in EO that were at like a, a level beyond where I was telling me about yeah. what it was going to be like when I got there. Yeah. And the, several of them always shared that the problems don't go away. Yeah. They just actually get bigger. Yeah. But your ability to handle them, and maybe you're a little desensitized as well because you've dealt with something easier than that. Like yeah. you figured out something and then the pro the problem gets bigger, yeah. but it's relatively the same size as to your overall experience. And so, man, I mean, I, I've talked to some folks where you had government agencies coming after them and all that kind of thing. Just like, holy crap, nothing I could yeah. even imagine with my smaller success, but you know, but you have more team around you and you have more lawyers, but e either way, the idea of just problems will continue and the whole point is to be able to to get through them and to progress yes and i mean in in my experience i've also dealt with situations where even you know we have come a long way and we have had you know success and failures but the thing that you learn along the way is how to find well first of all how to frame that problem in a way that you can explain to someone and find the right person to do that like I have had, you know, very, uh, several difficulties in delegation. Like I, it took me a long time to, to delegate stuff. You know, we, I had no, um, experience in the corporate world. So, you know, I started from ground up right after the school, it was all, you know, um, with, with no prior corporate experience and in, in the, you know, in the management role, you, you just get into, you are building stuff yourself. So you're learning as you're growing, as you're going. So it does take some time for you to learn and you, you, you grow, you fall, you grow, you fall. And then with that fall, how, you know, it is th that what differentiate you and make you a better leader, like how quickly you can learn and adapt. Right. Yeah. So delegation has been one of those things that has been very, very, um, came very hard for me. Like I, I was not doing a good job in delegating. I kept things to myself, doing things my, you know, yeah. I, nobody can do this. I have to do it. I have to own it. I have to own it. So it took me a long time to, to, uh, to learn. And then there was a hard moment, you know, yes, I think now 
uh, they, we, we have to let go. We have to start saying no. I think this also goes back to our, my, my, the, the Indian culture, right? It's hard for me, for us in people in India to say no. I mean, if you ever dealt with, you know, people in India, you'll um, experience this one thing. They will never say no. And, um, and that I think was ingrained in me and that took some time for me to, you know, deal with and, you know, no, I, I'm not ready to take this. I cannot take this. I have to delegate. I have to have somebody else do it. Sorry. So, um, yeah, I mean, fi finding, you know, learning along the way and finding the right way to frame the question and delegating and finding the right person is very important. Amazing. Amazing. Shifting a little bit. Let's talk about the future. What what excites you about the future? Can you see some things, some trends happening right now that are a bit exciting to you and maybe can share with us what's going to happen in the future? Well, I'm not sure if I'm excited, but I'm definitely curious and looking forward to how automation is going to change the outsourcing industry. I mean, I'm the business of outsourcing and offshoring. So with um, automation, AI, machine learning, things are already going at a so fast pace. The things like, you know, stuff that you use to outsource, you know, your virtual assistant, your, um, you know, healthcare, your bookkeeping, your researching, your uh, marketing, all of these things are getting upgraded with machines. When that starts happening, what will happen to the offshoring? What will happen to the whole industry, which everyone is so much relying on and, you know, yeah. so that, that is the topic that fascinates me. I would, I look, I'm curiously looking forward to what happens. And I, I see some opportunities. Um, there will be, there will always be a need for human engagement, human involvement, but right. I think it will change into a model. I, I think it's already is in that direction of some, um, some are so using, so the way I see it will happen is you will, people in the Western world, Western countries, they're going to have somebody um, manage, you know, that task, have project manager or program manager, account manager, whatever you want to call it. And then a team of people in some other country at a lower wage using some of the automation tools. So combination of all those things will bring the productivity up and help and bring the cost down yeah. um, and more revenue and growth is what I foresee. Amazing, man. Amazing. Well, you know, I know a lot about you, but not everyone else does. So I just want to ask you this question. Who are you? Who are you? Can you take me back in time to like little Varun days? What was it like growing up? Did you always know you're going to be leading, you know, employees and running a business and growing a company? No, no. I I never imagined that I would be here. I would never thought that I would come to this country. Um, so my, it goes back to my days in, in high school, even middle school. My dad used to work in uh, a government service. So he was a you know, government employee. He thought that I would do the same thing. So he would basically, you know, um, uh, that that's what we 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 were taught like you know that's right and in india when you in the school you have only two options either you become an engineer or you become a doctor there was no option for me so i was getting trained to become an engineer go to an engineering college come back and serve the government um become some engineer a civil engineer an electric engineer computer engineer or whatnot like you know you just have yeah. a government service yeah but um uh, Fortunately, um, I, so my, my uncle, he had a business, he was an entrepreneur. Um, he pulled me into his business. So he basically, we had a deal that, um, he would sponsor my college and I would give my six years of life to work with his, with him, with his business. So that was a deal. And I thought, all right, let's do it. So, you know, I had nothing to lose because college education was not cheap. Uh, my dad was not, you know, he did not have a lot of money to spend on it. He had all his saving, which I was able to save because I was able to get my college funded by my uncle. 
So he was in computer, in, in, that was the internet boom going on. He saw an opportunity, he started a business, I joined him and that's what changed the course of my, you know, my career, my life where um, I got into it. I had no other way to go. You know, I signed up for that. Let's just continue with the college. I started working on the business and, you know, things just start moving in the right direction for me. And uh, opportunities after opportunities kept coming. And we saw a model where um, it would be useful for us to have me here because many of our customers were coming from here, from North America. So I moved right. to this country. And since then, never looked back. <laughs> never looked yeah. back? You visited a couple of times, but... Yeah, I mean, not, never looked back in, in terms of going back or moving back to the yeah. country. I mean, because now, you know, I have two kids. Um, they are going to be grow here. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't see myself. Can imagine going back. Um, That's awesome. Living my life there, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how family can be a strength. Sometimes for people, families can be a weakness, but they really can. You can leverage that. You can be strong if you're together with them it's it certainly in my case it's certainly so much true like we are very you know i have a very you know supportive family members uh, which we can rely on and they played a huge role in in my life yeah. so cool so cool man it, it's all those little tiny twists and turns and that's how we end up in eo boston together and hiking on a podcast. Yeah. All these things. Um, and, you know, and you spent some time, a little bit, what, New York as well? Yes. So uh, my first step into this uh, country was, so I, I came, um, you know, 15, 16 years ago to do my um, master's. So I did my computer science, um, you know, um, masters here in New NYU. That's right. in, um, you know, my, yeah, that, that was the city. So that was another thing, like, you know, growing up in a very small town and coming to one of the largest cities <laughs> in the world, <laughs> that was like, I had a culture shock, you know, I mean, <laughs> it was very, very difficult for me in the beginning to adjust and adapt to, to people, to the culture, to the country. Um, so you were in a small town back in India? Yeah, I lived in the mountains, actually. Oh, the, really? Uh, yeah. In the mountains? In the mountains. That's where a hiking yeah. comes from. That's why you're so good at it. Yeah. <laughs> so I had I saw to take, the, like three I, steps to your one. I, I saw <laughs> the short as I worked. I, I saw them, you know, climbing mountains every oh, day. Oh, really? Used to, yeah, I used to, um, you know, I was not a hiker when I was little. I mean, it was, I was just like 10-year-old um, when I first climb little mountain, but yes, we had, um, you know, some tigers walking in our backyard. We were like right at the bottom of the, you know, huge mountain. It was a small town, um, up, you know, a valley. And what was it was, what was the valley called? There's a town. It's called Sundar Nagar. Um, it's hard to spell like S U N D A R N A G A R. Sundar Nagar, N A G A R. You see it in Rapur? Yeah. In Himachal Pradesh, is that? Oh, uh, oh, oh, I see it. Yeah. Sundar Nagar. Look at yeah. this thing up. Right on the, uh, the little lake there. Yes, that was a dam. That is where they produce electricity. So oh, really? Had, uh, yeah. So that, yeah, that was the idea. Like, you know, my, when my dad used to work in that government, they were, he was basically an engineer and they, built little townships in several parts of the, you know, country um, in uh, northern states where the job was to basically, you know, build a dam and you need various people. You need civil engineer, you yeah. need electrical engineer, you need these type of people to run the city, to run the town and then produce electricity. And that's what, you know, we grew up in. And they had little schools and I, we used to walk in, you know, my wow. school was, you know, just around the corner. The, 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 funny, the, the difficult thing was, you know, th this is one thing that people don't really experience here in this country. There, there is no centralized heat. 
So we used to live in, you know, sub-zero temperatures yeah. without heat. Really? Right? So we had, yeah, we had coal burning right beside our bed to keep the room warm. Wow. We had, so. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. crazy. Yeah. To think it's about cool. that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at you. It's, you're right near Tibet and China and Nepal. Yes, you're right. It was now. it was right, yeah, in near uh, Himalayas in Jam in Kashmir, the state of Kashmir, just below that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see it. Yep, Kashmir. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you, so, you know, talk about just a simple, humble beginning. So you're you're burning coal at night so you can not freeze and. Yes. And would yeah. you have like everybody in the same room to really kind of preserve the heat? Did you have like the, the animals below the house or is that more like the Paul? No. So yeah, no, we, we like, you know, yes, we do. Like we had a little house, like my parent, my sister, we used to spend time together in, in the room together in the night when there's freezing cold. Um, and I remember one time, like we did not used to have a lot of snow, but it was really cold. So one night, um, in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m., we got first snowfall that we saw. And uh, my friend, he called me in the middle of the night, like, you know, we're on, let's go out, it's snowfall, you know, we need to, you know, see. Like, even though, um, so yeah, that was pretty amazing, first time wow. that we saw the snow. And now look here in Boston, like we see snow, you know, oh, yeah. like two feet of snow. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> it's crazy. Have you, I, I was just looking at it. Like literally right now I can be on Google street view and I can see yeah. the downtown area. Uh, yeah. It's kind of crazy how small the world can be when, when you can just click through and see the dam, you know, or yeah. you're talking about. That's, it's that's one thing I just right want now. to go. That's where I want to go right now. That's where, I mean, if I go back to India for some time, that's where my first uh, step would be, you know, to just go and go back to my house where I grew up, you know. Do you have any family still back in that area? No, nobody lives there anymore. Too cold. Too cold. Yeah. <laughs> we all, more of my family moved to central part of India. It's a little more warmer. Makes sense. They didn't really want to hike, hike so much. Yeah. yeah. I see you have that, uh, the Bina forest right, right nearby too. Looks like mm -hmm. for some good hiking, maybe. Yeah. Um, wow, man. Well, this is really cool. Hypothetical question for you. I may or may not have a time machine up here in New Hampshire. So let's say we're going to go hiking, get some beers. You get to use a time machine. You get to go back in time and you get to meet yourself. Yeah. Maybe yourself as you just came to the U.S. or even yourself before when you're still in India, you know, right around your undergrad degree. You get to talk to that version of you and you get to give yourself advice or recommendations. To just say hi. What kind of things would you tell yourself? What would I, what advice would I give at that time? Yeah. To your younger self. Um, I think to me, I have, I've learned that living in the moment is so important these days. Like back in the time I was so worried. I still remember, um, that stress of what will happen in the future. What will I do? You know, it was not worth it. It was not worth at that time to just be anxious about what, what will happen in the future. I mean, uh, that's the one advice I think I would want to give to myself. Like, you know, enjoy the moment, live in the present, be more mindful. You know, how can you be more kind? Because that's what I have learned. That's what I keep, I, that, that's a topic I read every day as well. You know, right. I, I, you know, uh, I know, like, so one of the books that I really like, uh, think like a monk, right? I think I've mentioned to you a few times, like, you know, by Jay Shetty, he was one of the guests in EO as well, that I really enjoy. I must have read it, you know, a few times on, you know, the things that I really, and that that is a topic that really fascinates me. I, I so much truly believe in that because that's a true happiness that can bring to you by thinking and having that mindset you know do you think you'd listen to yourself 
Do I listen to myself? Yeah, like if you gave yourself this advice, younger would younger you listen? Hmm. <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> I think no. I don't think at that age you would have the capacity and understanding. But I would still want to give that advice, even though I would know that the the younger me is not going to, you know, understand at that time. But I also believe that things, when, when you hear people say things a few times and over and over again, it just, you know, you, you are able to relate to some of the incidents, you know, right. You, it will come to you eventually. It's like plant the seed then with the younger you, maybe it'll, it'll grow a tree a little bit sooner. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool, man. Cool. So, uh, so you're down for the, the final 48, the hikes. Oh man, I'm so much looking forward to it. Should we start in the yeah. winter? Should we wait for it to be? I am already, I'm, it's all you. You are the one, I told you, right? <laughs> you are the one who got me into it. You are the one who, you know, stopped me from doing it. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of, you kind of, yeah, kind of. Yeah. 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 The best, yeah. this, the best part of. So let, let me ask you, what, what was the best part for you to do the hiking? Why, why, why did you get into hiking? Um, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, great question. Um, something about it. Something about it. Seeing the, seeing a top, the top of something seems kind of neat. Like it's a magical place. Like what's up there? And is it? And it's, it's neat because it's somewhere that not a lot of other people are and you can't yeah. magically transport yourself there. You can't buy it. You can't buy your way up there. There's some places that have roads, but some of these places don't have roads. I remember that one of the hikes we, we did near Waterville, um, around Osceola, we found that like weird, cool rest spot where you could look out over that Valley and you're like, no one else can see this Valley, yeah. you know? To see this amazing sight, you have to literally climb up here and, and to see it yourself. I, I like something about that feels really cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that plus I, I love that it's, it's like, it's kind of a workout, but it's sort of a subtle workout. Like when we went hiking for hours at a time, you know, our watches would tell us we're burning like thousands of calories versus you know, some, some quick hit gym class. You're like, Oh, I burned, you know, 200, 300. So it was always kind of neat that this exploration was also a challenge too. I remember there were some times where I was about ready to die. So it was great having a, a hiking buddy. You remember that one time, um, it was, uh, off of Lafayette and I'm just like dying. <laughs> I'm so tired. And that trail went on forever to get back after the hut. So I was like, let's talk about, we talked about money. I don't know if you remember that part. Yeah, We're like, let's that. talk about something to just take our minds off of how long this trail is. But yeah. there's something about getting back to the parking lot being like, yeah, we made this. And every now and yeah. then we had chairs with us too. that you could yeah. just sort of sit down and drink just, beer. Yeah. And drink yeah, a beer. Just be like in yeah. the moment, like you're saying earlier, just being in the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, well, well, I, I got into hiking because I like beating you. I like, you know, getting ahead and wow. be the first person. <laughs> I like you dying, you know. I, <laughs> yeah, no. you're like, oh, I'm strong, man. He's <laughs> dying back there. No, I think, um, I think for me, it's, it's, it's definitely one thing that challenges you the most. I yeah. think, you know, it tests your fitness level for sure. Right. Right. I mean, you know, some of the mountains that we climbed were not easy, right? It took right. us like, what, I don't remember the name, but it took us like eight, nine hours. That was my limit, right? That was, that's, that's like, what that I was, was that, that was the money one though, right? Where we talked about like whatever we could talk about on the way back with the hut. Okay. okay. Franconia yeah. Notch. Yeah. Or, or, or is the rainy one on the other side, uh, up Cannon and down. Yes, I think that was very well. Yes. Yeah, that was my limit too. I was, well, that was that, pretty rough. Yeah. So, but yeah, so that, and, and the feeling that you get after finishing that, I think that's what I crave for. Like, that's what yeah. gets me excited and let's go back there and then 
finish it. And next time, you know, you know, this time we just did it for finishing it. And my next challenge would be to finish it in finishing them on time, like faster, if we can do it, yeah. you know. So that would challenge even more. But you know, the yeah. only the only time I actually remember, like the one time I I was beating you is because you had like a cold or something, <laughs> 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 or you had like you had injured yourself. I think it was just one time you're like, oh, I think I just you know fighting off something. So I'm like, sweet, yeah. it was yeah. it was great. Yeah. You're slow. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm uh, fast today. <laughs> yeah. Plus you meet, you get to meet so many nice people, you know? Oh man, we met some great people. Mountain Mary, all those other folks. That was just super fun. Just random hikers you meet and yeah. super nice. And, and, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was also fun. Is it, if you were out there hiking this crazy thing and you saw someone yeah. else hiking, like you at least knew you're both crazy, you know, yeah. you both had a passion so yeah. you could relate to each other. Yeah. yeah that was, that was a lot of fun. So. Good times, man. We'll have to get back at it. We got 48 mountains to climb. We've done 21 of them. So. 22. 22? Yeah. My record's wrong. Are we at 22 now? Yeah. 26 left. I'll have to check. I, I could have swore we we're at 22. Uh, 21, I mean, but okay. Cool. And for the people listening, we actually have an Excel spreadsheet to track these things. And in New Hampshire, there's a list of 48 mountains that are above 4,000 feet. If you climb all of them, and you document this, and you send a little letter in. They send you a patch that has the number 48 with a mountain on it. It's this little simple, small patch, but it's kind of a neat achievement to have climbed all the 48 peaks yeah. in the state above 4K. So that's what we're doing. That's our mission. And we're going to finish it this year in 22. Here you go. Boom. Well, hey, man, this is fun. Where can people connect with you if they want to reach out? Um, maybe drop a little bit of information about Galaxy, all that good stuff. Yep. So uh, my LinkedIn would be the best way to connect with me. Um, and Varun Bihani, anyone can search and it will come up. I'm not very active on Twitter. So Twitter, Facebook is something you will never find me. But um, yeah, uh, I think best way is the LinkedIn. Got it. And it's galaxywebblinks.com. Is that right? Galaxywebblinks.com is the name of the company. That's our you know, website name. Definitely, you know, check that out. All right. We'll link through, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on here. It's a lot of fun. You know, talk a little hiking, a little business. Absolutely. Thank you. Zen monk. All right. For those people listening, if you learned something, and I know you did, because I freaking have notes over here saying that I've learned a few things or two about books and client experience and expectation setting, um, having a meeting cadence, and even the idea of, you know, living like a monk and, and some good books to read and, and thinking about the, the restaurant analogy and the ambience and the setup and the smells, the utensils and the silverware and the placemats and all those things. It was a great, great podcast. So if you learn something, share this episode with someone else. Maybe there's another business leader that you, you know that isn't in EO yet, and they should be. And with that, Varun, thanks, dude. I'll see you on the next hike. All right. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. This has been another exciting episode of Leadership in Action. We will see you all next time. Leadership in Action is sponsored by the Boston Chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization. As the world's only peer-to-peer -peer network exclusively for entrepreneurs, EO helps transform the lives of those who transform the world.